Uh, we're going to take a break from the book of 1 Corinthians once again. I was studying that passage all week, and nothing, Lord, come on, what? And, you know, sometimes when you're doing a verse-by-verse study through the Bible and, and the Lord's not giving you anything during the week, you have to think, maybe He doesn't want me to teach on this passage this week. Ah, and that's the case. And so we're going to revert back a little bit. Um, since my heart and my mind is focused on this mission trip right now, I just really came to a place of realizing that the Lord is, that's what's on my heart right now, and that's what I want to share with you guys. And, and so we're going to look at Acts chapter 16, uh, verse 6 through 11 here today. The Macedonian call is what I've entitled this. And, you know, these graphics are going to look very familiar to some of you guys because I taught through the book of Acts uh, just recently, about two years ago. And so many of you are going to remember some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. But when I taught it before, we had no idea that we were going down to Guatemala. At that point, we were waiting on the Lord. We were seeking the Lord and asking Him, Lord, where do you want us to go? What uh, mission do you want us to do in the world? Where is our Samaria? Where is our uttermost parts of the world for this church? Where do you want us to be, Lord? How do you want to use us? And, and we were in that place at that time, and, and so many things have transpired since then. And uh, it was just amazing to me, the things that happened last year when I was down there, and I'm going to share a couple of those things here today. And then when I sent Pastor Francisco in Guatemala City an email and I just said, hey, do you want me to teach when I'm down there? Would you like me to teach uh, on Sunday when I'm down in Guatemala with you? And, and he said, yes, absolutely. Here, teach this passage. And he just said, Acts chapter 16, verse 6 through 11. And I said, okay, that's cool. What is that again? And I opened my Bible and went to it and I just thought, no way. And that's just where he is in his study going through the book of Acts. And so, here, why don't you just continue on where I'm at? And so, it's an amazing thing, uh, the way the Lord works. And so, if you follow along with me, we'll just read through the text there, and then we'll come back and look at a few things here. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man from Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, And the next day came to Neapolis. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth, Lord. And we ask that you would just open our hearts to receive it here today, that we'd listen to your still small voice and be led by it. Uh, Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, well again, um, how do you end up in a place like Guatemala as a church in the United States? How do you just kind of decide, do you, do you take a globe and just kind of spin it and then go, bam, we're going to go there. We're going to take all of our efforts and, and all of our money and our resources and, and we're just going to buy some plane tickets and head on down there and just find out what's going on. Well, that would be a silly way of doing it, obviously. It's not what's done in the book of Acts, as we see here. Uh, Paul and, and, and Silas and Barnabas and these guys and Peter, they were being led by the Holy Spirit. That's the model for the church, for the early church, and it should be the model for today. And the circumstances surrounding how we ended up in Guatemala are truly miraculous. And, and some of you might have forgotten, and, and some of you, of course, are very new. And, and so I really want you to understand how amazing it is that we are in Guatemala and we're, we're going down there again. And uh, just how we involved we how involved we want to be down there. How this has all worked out. Uh, you need to know that because when you realize, you know, it's it's there's no uh, circumstantial, you know, just it, it, God planned this thing. God organized this thing, and He is sending us down there. And it's not a coincidence at all. And, and so I think you'll be able to clearly see that as we go through here today and look at this, but. You know, as we were praying, as we were waiting on the Lord and asking Him to just 
make a, a mission field available to us. A man and a woman just kind of showed up at our church one day. Just came in the door and, and uh, just started attending. And lo and behold, after a little while as I was talking with them, I realized that, that he knows my old pastor, Pastor Tony Clark, who, used to, who had come to our church once before and taught. And he used to attend his church. And then I find out that he's a missionary in Guatemala. He goes down to Guatemala. He's been going down there for a while. And so as we began to talk about that, you know, I thought, well, maybe this is how God is leading us. Maybe this is, you know, a a word from the Lord. He's sending this man and this woman who are already involved in a mission field down in Guatemala. And uh, maybe that's how God wants to use us down there. And so we began to talk more. And uh, he said, hey, I've got all these pictures of Guatemala that I'd like to take and, and put up in the window. That's when we were in the mall. You guys remember we had those pictures in the window of the mall. And they were from Guatemala. And one day in the mall, a man was walking through the mall and, and he stopped and he looked at those pictures and he... That's my hometown. That's where I'm from. And he came in the mall and he said, hey, what are these pictures doing out here? And, and I said, oh, that we're... We we're thinking about going down to Guatemala and, and, and reaching out to them. And, and we have a missionary here in our church that goes down there. And Well, that's where I'm from. That's, that's like 15 miles from my hometown right there. And I thought, wow, that's crazy, you know? <laughs> wow. And so this guy just starts attending our church for that reason right there, is that we were reaching out to his people, his home village, and, and close to his village. And so as time went by, we, we said, well, we need to go down there. And, and this, is, this is pretty interesting. Let's go down there and check it out. And so last March, a year ago, myself and Matt and Anita went down. And this man that was attending our church, Franz, many of you know him, he, he kept saying things like, you know, you need to contact my dad when you're down there. But he didn't give us his phone number. And, and when we were there, we were staying with the family there and we got a phone call from this woman who said, hey, I need to come over and talk to you. And uh, we said, well, who is it? And she said, well, she says she's related to somebody in your church. And so I called this woman. She says, yes, I'm Francis' sister. And I live right down the street here, and I, I want to come and talk to you guys. And so I said, well, come on over. And so it turns out she's related to the people that we're staying with in this little village. We thought... Wow, you're, you know these people? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're cousins. And she says, France is my brother. And, and uh, I used to live in the United States. I lived in, in uh, L.A. for 20 years, and I attended Pastor Chuck's church in Costa Mesa for seven years. And I love Calvary Chapel. Wow, that's crazy. Well, what are you doing down here? Well, I just got sick of the rat race, and I just moved back to my hometown, and I wanted to, I'm a teacher, and I wanted to teach my, my kids down here in my village. And so she said, well, and I, I teach Sunday school at my church. And I said, really, how many kids do you have? Oh, I've got about 19 kids there. Well, that's great. How many people attend the church? Oh, we don't have any people attending, any adults. She said, uh, the pastor left about two years ago, and we haven't had a pastor since. And uh, I said, so you teach out of your home? And she's, no, we have a building. We have a church building. And I said, really? And she goes, yeah, we own it. My, my family owns the building. And so I said, well, what are you doing with the building? She goes, well, we're just having Sunday school there right now for these kids. And so I said, well, what are your plans for the building? She said, well, we'd love to have a pastor come. We'd love to have a pastor come and and be our pastor. And I said, well, what kind of church is it right now? She said, well, it was a Presbyterian. And I said, what kind of church do you want it to be? And she said, I'd love it to be a Calvary Chapel. And so I'm just like, is somebody punking me out here? I'm just looking around going, is this candid camera or something? It was just so bizarre to me. And I said, well, let's go look at this building. And so she took us 15 miles, 20 miles down the road. And sure enough, here's this little chapel. No pastor. Lots of people. And we had a service there. And many people from the community came. And and so that's kind of how it all started. And it was just amazing to me. And I I began to realize this is why God has called us here. This is why God has, he set this whole thing up. And it's just, it can't be a coincidence. It just can't be. And I 
I thought, and Francisco and I looked at each other, and we said, this is like a Macedonian call. And Matt thought the same thing. How could so many, I mean, what are the odds of that happening? It's incredible. And so as we find in the Bible, certainly with the story that we're looking at today and so many occasions, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit. We need to be doing the things that He's leading us to do. And those doors that He closes and those doors that He opens, we need to be obedient to go through those things and not try to knock down the doors that are closed. Romans 8.14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And what a feeling it is when we realize, man, God is directing my steps. He loves me enough to come through all of eternity and, and speak into my heart and arrange these things so that, so that I can be led by Him and so that I can do His will. And so I could be a part of what He wants to do in me and, and through me and in you and through you. It's amazing. I, I'm a child of God. He loves me enough as my, as my Heavenly Father to lead me and guide me in that way, and to direct me in that way. And that passage goes on a little bit later and says, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if we indeed suffer with Him. He wants us to come along for the ride in this journey of life. And He says, hey, there's going to be hard times. There are going to be difficulties. You're going to have to make some sacrifices. And you're going to have to suffer a little bit. But come along with me. And we have a great plan, the, the Trinity would say to you and I, for you, for your life. As you are led by my Spirit, as you are transformed into the image of my Son, and as you're doing my will, the Heavenly Father says, come along that we may also be glorified together. It's an amazing thing. In Luke chapter 2, and this is a passage we've looked at at Christmas time a few times, but it's another one of those uh, kind of leading of the Lord type of things, says this man, Simeon, says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, right around the time that Jesus, Jesus had just been born. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was a man devout, seeking the Lord. He was waiting upon the Lord. The Lord had made a promise to him that you are going to see the Messiah. Before you die, you're going to see God's ultimate plan. It will be revealed to you through His Messiah, through His Son. And so the Holy Spirit was upon him as he waited upon that. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so it was at that time that the Lord led him down to the temple on the very same day that Jesus' parents had taken him to the temple and he was able to see the Messiah and to bless the parents and the child of the Messiah. He came to the temple by this, uh, he came by the Spirit into the temple. And so, Throughout Scripture, you know, we, we see these kind of things. How important is it for us to be led by the Spirit rather than to just kind of fumble through life? Oh, it, it's night and day. Night and day. Spin the globe, put your finger on something, or just wait on the Lord and allow Him to show you and tell you and open the doors. Not to force doors open, but just allow the Lord to open those doors for us. On Paul's first missionary journey, in chapter 13, verse 2, it says, And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. They fasted. They ministered to the Lord. They were seeking the Lord. They were all in one accord, and they were coming and saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? How do you want to use us? Fasting, that idea of just separating themselves from their flesh, crucifying that flesh, and just not giving in to those fleshly desires for a time so that there's no obstacles to keep us from clearly hearing what the Lord wants to tell us. We're not walking in the flesh. We're walking in the Spirit, listening to Him. 
and just allowing Him to speak to us. We want to hear His voice clearly. And you know, for months I've been saying, guys, please pray. Please pray for this mission trip. Well, we're down to the wire. Have you been praying? Have you been seeking the Lord? Have you been asking Him, Lord, bless this ministry. Bless this trip down there. I hope you have, but if you haven't, start now. It's not too late. We want to see an outpouring of God's Spirit down in Guatemala, and we want to see fruit just abundantly come forth from what we're doing. It'd be fun to go down there and just have a good time. It'd be fun to go down there and put a little check in the blocks and say, wow, I feel like I've done my Christian duty. I've gone on my little short-term ministry mission trip. And, and uh, you know, for the younger folks that are going with us, it'll be an experience of a lifetime and all that kind of stuff. And those are all added benefits of going on a mission trip, certainly. But man, don't we want to see hundreds and even thousands of people come to know the Lord? and get grounded in His Word as a result of what we're trying to do here? That comes from us seeking the Lord, ministering to the Lord, waiting upon Him, fasting, denying our flesh, walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh. And that's what they were doing here. And at the end of that time, then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, They went down to Cilicia and from there they sailed to Cyprus and then they went on that first missionary journey. And so just what we did here this morning, we sent them out, we laid hands on them and we said, now go. Go in the power of the Spirit and do the work of the Spirit down in Guatemala. Be used by Him. Keep praying those prayers for the next two weeks, please. Keep seeking the Lord. Take a day out of the week and just say, I'm going to set myself aside today. I'm going to crucify the flesh and just allow the Lord to speak to my heart. As you speak to Him, as you seek Him, as you diligently pray for those folks that are down there in harm's way, sword. I encourage you to do that this week. The Macedonian call... A couple things we'll look at here. Follow the leader. Follow the leader. And who is the leader? It's the Lord. Follow the leading of His Spirit. As we'll look at that. And to do that, we must listen and we must receive. Receiving is that idea of, of doing it, right? It's one thing to hear it. But you hear it and then you put it into practice. You do it. You're obedient to follow through and do what He tells you to do when He tells you to do it. Well, as we go back and and look again at verse 6 there, it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. And so we have here some no's. We have here is what we call in Christianese some closed doors. (laughs) No, I don't want you to go that way. And we're going to look at a map here in a minute that will just amaze you as how God's saying, nope, don't go left. Nope, don't go right. Just keep on going the direction you're going. And then God leads them to a dead end, it, it would seem. Can't go that way. Can't go that way. He takes them right to the water's edge. And you know, as we go through life, we get no's sometime, from time to time. Lord, this is what I want to do. Lord, can I do this? Is is this what you want me to do? And, and we seek after those things. Maybe they're a work of the flesh and we just want to do that, but it's a no. Well, no's an answer from the Lord. And I encourage you not to get discouraged by no's. No's are not a bad thing. A no that you turn into a yes, now that's a bad thing. A no that you say, well, maybe the Lord really doesn't know what He's talking about. I'm, I'm going to do this anyway and I'll work it out and He'll forgive me if, you know, whatever. But man, we don't want to be outside of God's will. He has our best interests at heart. He knows what the future holds. He knows what He wants to accomplish in our lives. And when we force that door open, when we just, ah, I don't want to hear it, we go off into no man's land. And, and it might be quite a while before we get back on the right road. And so consider that. No is not a bad thing. No is an answer. Maybe is an answer. Wait is an answer. 
We don't always get the yeses. Yeses aren't the greatest thing for us. And so the idea of being forbidden by the Holy Spirit, none of us want to hear that. You're forbidden. You can't do that. Oh, yeah? Really? Hmm. We'll see about that. I mean, that's just that. That brings out that rebellious nature in us, doesn't it? You know, you tell your kid, no. I'll just do it when he's not watching. You know, kind of thing. Forbidden by the Holy Spirit, you can't go that way. John 6, 63 says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And so if the Spirit says no to you, the, the opposite of, of doing His will is death. The Spirit brings life. The flesh profits nothing. The flesh brings death. It brings dis- destruction, as we've looked at so many times. And so if the Spirit forbids you, Don't force it. Do not force it. Don't try to force that door open. Uh, Outside of His will, we just looked at that. I I don't want to go into that. But, you know, I was thinking about the the feeble plans that we have as human beings, you know. The things that we think are are the ideal. The things that we think are, are really what we need to be doing in life. I was just thinking about how feeble life is. Just recently, I was actually last summer... Uh, and I shared this with a couple of the guys, I think, in, in the morning men's thing. But, you know, I was, a bunch of us were going to get together and go swimming with the uh, youth group down at the river, down by uh, Founders. And, uh, and so I went back to the house, got my swimming suit, got the kids together, got a towel, you know, and just kind of getting my stuff together. And I, I wanted to take a, a mask and a snorkel down there. And, you know, swim under the water and stuff. And so I went down in the garage and, you know, I've got 20 years in the, in the Navy. You know, I have got these bags just stacked up in the basement, in the garage, you know, of all the, all my old military equipment. And, and so I went in the bag and got my mask and my snorkel out of there. And, and you know, for 15 years of my life, that bag represented my strength, my, my youth, my, uh, just who I am as a man, you know, my wetsuits and my my fins and my mask and my snorkel. I mean, that was my job in the Navy, jumping out and rescuing people out of the helicopters, and and that was that's my manhood. That's who I am. That was my identity. And you know, I reached out to that mask and I grabbed the kind of the part around the nose there, the real soft, rubbery part, and I grabbed it and it fell apart in my hands. The rubber had returned to the elements of which it was formed. (laughs) And I went, what? And I grabbed it again and it was just like ashes. It was like ashes that you'd take out of a fireplace of a box that had been burned or something. Just nothing. It fell apart in my hands. And it it just shattered me. You know, the image of who I am, my identity, it's gone. It's It's nothing. And I think it was, it's just such a strong picture of, you know, the plans that we have, the goals that we have in life. This life is a fleeting glimpse. We're like a flower that, that blooms for a little short period of time and then we fade. And so the time that we have here is so precious. Do we want to waste that time by doing something outside of the will of God? Or do we want to hear that voice and we want to not go left, not go right, go this way? Because the plans that He has for us are eternal. And they don't fade. And they don't fall apart like that rubber. They last forever. And so there's an investment to be made there. Just recently chopped up one of my wetsuits for a costume for the puppets that we're going to use down in Guatemala. (laughs) <laughs> hey, it's all going to burn someday, right? But four years ago when I retired from the Navy, I would have never, ever considered that. Chop up one of my wetsuits? What? No way. Well, they don't fit me anymore anyway, so it's all right. <laughs> yeah, chop them up. They're out of style. They don't fit. Go for it. <laughs> Luke 24:49 says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. 
Don't even think about leaving here, Jesus said. I want you to go out into the uttermost parts of the world, but don't even think about leaving Jerusalem until you've got the power of my spirit because you'll fail and you'll fail miserably. It's basically what he was saying to him. You need to be led by my spirit. My spirit brings life. The flesh profits nothing. We have to listen to his spirit, be led by his spirit. And when he says no, we have to take it as a no. Well, again, Paul's second missionary journey is is what we're talking about here. Um, And so you've seen this map before if you've been with us for a while. They left Jerusalem and and just kind of started heading around the uh, the over to Greece and and so they were going through that 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 part of Asia Minor there and and you see the the towns there Phrygia Galatia we were forbidden to go there we wanted to go uh, when we came to Mysia he tried to go into Bithynia but then the Spirit did not permit them and so you see them just kind of winding their way through there and. They head over to Troas and they come to the edge of the water. And you come to that place of saying, what do we do now? He didn't want us to go that way. He didn't want us to go that way. And now we're at the edge of the water. What are we going to do now? And I submit to you that that is exactly where God wants to lead each one of us. To the edge. To the edge of ourselves. To the edge of what we can accomplish on our own power, in our own thoughts, in our own plans. And he wants to take you right to the edge and say, okay, you done? You figured everything out now? You got it all down? No? Okay, well, let me take over now. Let me drive for a while. Get in the back seat. I don't even want you as a co-pilot. Just get in the back seat. I'll drive. And that's exactly what's happened with Paul here. And we don't see any... Uh, sense that Paul was angry with God saying no or he was trying to force it or go against God's will. But, you know, you, you can't get to that place of just saying, well, geez, what do we do now? What do we do now? Which way do we go now? And there's a time of waiting and a time of just not striving. I don't know what to do and so I've got to make something up. I've got to figure it out. I've got to strive. I've got to worry about this for a little while. I've got to get all wrapped around the axle about how I'm going to make this happen. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm, going to, I'm freaking out. You guys ever do that or is that just me? I think it's just me. Anyway, you guys wouldn't do that. So he comes to the edge there. Passing by Mysia, they came down, down to Troas. There are many stories in the Bible that go right along with this same idea. Come to the edge of yourself. Jacob, got my uncle chasing me back here, wants to kill me. Got my brother in front of me, wants to kill me. I'm between a rock and a hard place. What do I do now? He's striving, he's wrestling with God, and he finally taps out. Okay, okay, all right, you win. I'll do what you want me to do. The children coming out of the Exodus, coming out of Egypt, God led them out into the desert and they were very happy. Hey, we escaped Egypt. And then God led them right to the to a little place like this. Many people believe this is actually the place that God led them to. Led them through that gnarly desert and then they get out to a place where they're trapped and the Egyptian army is in pursuit. And they begin to cry and freak out. Moses, why have you done this? Why would you lead us out here to die in this wilderness? We should have stayed back there in Egypt. They got nowhere to run. The army's behind them and they're hemmed in by the wilderness, it says. But it was at that point that God says, you watch this. Watch what I'm going to do now. You think you're trapped. You think you're come, you've come to the end of what you can accomplish. And God says, good. Now I guess you've got to trust in me. Now I guess you've got to put your full faith in me. And watch what I can do for you. That's a good place to be. Moses said to him, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see Again, no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Just hold your peace. Stand still. 
Don't strive. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Just wait. And you watch what the Lord's going to do. You put your full faith in Him and trust in what He's going to do. That's where He wants to bring us to. He wants to bring us to the edge, to the end of ourselves, where we stop striving and we just surrender and give it over to Him. And then He can do marvelous things through us and in us. If we don't allow Him to do that, then we just kind of flounder. Uh, which way do I go now? I know that many of you have probably come to that place and you might be in that place right now, sitting on the edge, sitting on the, the rock there in Troas. Couldn't go left, couldn't go right. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do now? How am I going to get out of this? Again, I encourage you, just wait on the Lord. Just wait. Don't try to help Him out. When I first got here, I had about three months of time where I didn't have to get a job right away um, because of some leave that I had saved up with the military and, and I wasn't quite done with my active duty yet. So I wasn't worried about it. When I first got here, hey, I've got three months, no problem. I can get a job in three months, no problem. And so I was just kind of sending out my resume just kind of casually for about two months. And then I thought... Uh, Lord, the uh, active duty paycheck's running out here next month. I don't know if you knew that or not. I was just wondering. Just put it out there for you. If you can get me a job, you know, that'd be great. And uh, I started striving and I started worrying and I started looking for jobs that maybe I could just settle with, you know. And I found a, a used car salesman job out at uh, Harper Motors. I said, well, I've got some sales experience, you know. I did some stuff in the Navy with recruiting and I could do that. And so I called them up and they interviewed me and they hired me right there and on the spot and yeah, come on over. And I started on Monday and by Wednesday at noon, I thought I've made a huge mistake. I was striving in the flesh and I have made a massive, huge mistake and this is not going to work. And I had to go to my manager and say, you know what? I'm going to have to quit. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't want to waste any more of your time. You, you guys are starting to train me now, and, and I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste your money. This is just not going to work out. And I quit. And I didn't strive. For the next two or three weeks, I just said, all right, Lord, I'm sorry. Lesson learned. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and, you know, I got a call one day just out of the blue from Chicago and these people offered me a job as a manager, and I wasn't even thinking about being a manager, but they offered me a job that, that uh, provided way more money and way more opportunity to minister to the congregation than I could have ever imagined. And it was just kind of handed to me. It was a tremendous job for being in the ministry. I had my own office, my boss was a, a Christian and he said, hey, you can, once you get your, all your work done, you can study and prepare sermons out here if you want. You know, that's fine. And uh, man, it was just incredible how God provided when I stopped striving, when I stopped worrying and, and, and just trying to accomplish on my own what I knew the Lord needed to do. And so I encourage you to wait on him. It's not an easy thing to do, but he calls us to do that. Psalm uh, 27, for courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. At the water's edge, what do we do when he says no? What do we do when he says no? Well, we've talked about striving, but the things that we should be doing, obviously be obedient. Take the no. Don't turn it into a yes. Follow the last instruction that you were given. What was the last thing that the Lord told you to do? And oftentimes we forget about that. I remember 1992-93 time frame is when I had the first inkling that maybe God wanted me to go into the ministry. And I had a sense that He wanted to prepare me for that. I wasn't ready for it then, certainly. 
And I, I began to sense that he said, prepare. And so I started to take some courses at the Bible college. I started just studying on my own and, and trying to prepare. And, and it was good. And I was really learning a lot of things. And I was growing and that calling was growing in my life. But then I, I, I just kind of lost that vision. And I started striving and going, Lord, if you want me to do this, how are you going to do this? What are you going to do? And, and there were several years that went by that I was just in this place of, man, I don't know if that was real. Was that really from the Lord? I don't know. Man, I don't know if he wants me to go into the ministry. And that calling started subsiding. But what did he tell me? He said, prepare. Prepare. Get ready. Yes, I want you to go into the ministry, but you're not ready to go into the ministry. So what do you got to do? You got to prepare. And so many times people come to me and say, you know, I want to be a missionary or I want to be in the ministry or I want to do this for the Lord. I want to do that. Well, what are you doing about it? Are you preparing? You can't just go into the ministry. You have to prepare yourself for that. And I'm not saying go to seminary. I'm not saying go to Bible college. Obviously, those are tools that help you. But you, it doesn't just happen. You know, the Lord has to do some things in you. He has to do some preparation work in you. And you have to study to show yourself approved. In, in every aspect, every job, whatever job you're going to do, you know, there has to be some preparation time. There has to be a time of, of being diligent to study. Follow that last instruction. Don't doubt in the darkness what God has told you in the life. I've quoted that many times. But it's so true. If God gave you an instruction back a few years ago and you've forgotten about that, you might want to turn back and say, okay, have I been obedient to do the things He's already asked me to do? Have I taken those steps of faith that He's already told me to take? Or have I just said, well, okay, I understand you want me to do that and maybe I'll get around to doing that. But have you done the things that He's asked you to do already in that preparation time? Or do you, are you just expecting it to happen? There's some preparation work that needs to happen. Keep on knocking on those doors, though. I, I don't think it's striving to uh, you know, knock on the door and just ask the Lord, hey, is this maybe something you want me to do? Is this something? Keep on knocking on doors. It's the only way you know if they're going to open or not. It's not striving to do that. You're just checking. Again, waiting is important. I've talked about that. But then walking by faith. Once you do hear that word, God never gives you the whole plan. You know, okay, you want me to do that? Okay, how am I going to do it? And you're, you're waiting for this step by step, step by step, step by step. First, I want you to do this. And then when you get that done, do this and then do this. And then I'll lead you over here. And then you're going to move here. And then 10 years from now, you're going to be living out there. And no, <laughs> take a step of faith. And then once you take that step, he opens another door. Oh. Okay, you take that step of faith and then you take another step of faith and he eventually gets you to the place that he wants you to be. But it takes that first step is is a doozy, as they say. And sometimes it's hard to just step out in faith and quit your job or to do something else, to go to school. But sometimes you just need to do it. It's like a Nike commercial. All right, well, continuing on, and this last part goes pretty quick here. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Isn't that what we're looking for? Where do you want us? What do you want us to do, Lord? There's a lot of people we could help out there. Let's help the people in Bithynia. Let's go up there. Nope. Let's help the people in Galatia and and Asia. Nope. There's a lot of people out there that God wants to minister to. But He has certain people that He wants us to minister to. And to use our time wisely and to be a good uh, steward of the resources that He has given us, we have to be led by Him. And we have to hear specifics about what He wants us to do sometimes. And so... In that verse there, he sees a vision, a man standing there pleading, please come over here and help us. We need your help. We need to hear this gospel that you have. 
We need to hear this liberty that you have. We need to hear the words of Jesus. As we look into our lives, as we begin as a young person, you know, we have many plans that we want to accomplish within our lives. I want you to turn back over to Proverbs for just a second. About two weeks ago, I was asked to go speak at Arcata Christian School uh, in the morning as a morning devotion at the chapel there with the kids. And and I agreed to it, and, and they said, well, this is the verse we want you to deal with, and, and this is kind of what we're doing right now, and so just teach on this basic idea here. And so I read through the, the verses there. The verse was 22, but I want to take you back to verse 20. It says in Proverbs 19, 20, listen to, the, listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. And then this is the verse they wanted me to do. What is desired in a man is kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. Loving kindness, the idea. And, you know, I ask those kids, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And there are, you know, uh, I don't know, all elementary, young, junior high kids. What do you want to be when you grow up? We all have many plans when we're young, don't we? I want to do this. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a movie star. I want to play video games. <laughs> And I told them about what I wanted to be. You know, I said, you know, I wanted to be a football player when I was a little kid. All my buddies, we played football morning, noon, and night. That's all we ever did is played football. And every one of us thought we were going to be in the NFL when we grew up. Every one of us thought, oh, I'm going to be a wide receiver. I'm going to be a running back. I'm going to be this. Nobody wants to be a center for some reason. I don't know why. With the glory, right? But, you know, and... Well into my junior high years, I thought that's what I was going to do. That's what I wanted to do. That's the only thing I wanted to do. And I remember one day a teacher came to me and said, you know, what are your plans? What do you want to do when you grow up? Well, I want to be a football player. And she said, well, that's good. That's good. And then she began to just tell me how difficult that was, how very elite of a, of a position that was and how hard it is to do that. And she encouraged me, but then she said, you know, you need to maybe look at some other things as well because, you know, it's not going to be easy to get to that place. And it wasn't a discouraging thing for me, but it was the first time I started thinking, maybe I should do something else. Maybe I, I can't do that. Maybe I'm not good enough. I don't know. Maybe I should consider something else at least. Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be, may be wise in your older days. When you're young, you just don't realize how hard life can be. And you don't realize that you need to make plans. And so we have many plans, many plans in our heart. But it says there, nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. When I went up to Gold Beach a couple of weeks ago, we went out to dinner and, and you know, it's a nice little resort town and... and uh, we just made a weekend out of it, and we were having a good time up there. And we went out to a, a fairly fancy restaurant. I mean, anything more than Applebee's is fancy for my family. But um, it was on the pier there. It was a seafood restaurant, you know, and, and fairly high scale. And you looked out the windows, big bay windows, and you looked out over the, the uh, fishing boats there and the yachts out in the harbor there. It was very nice. And we were there, and it was a nice meal. And as we were sitting there, there was other, only one other group of people in the restaurant. It was late at night, and, and uh, it was a bunch of men gathered around. And they were very loud. And uh, you could tell as you were listening to their conversation that they were very successful men. One of them, I know for sure, was a doctor. And, and you could just tell they had a lot of success in their life. And they were telling stories, and you could tell they, were, they were, had been friends for many, many years. Maybe, you know, two of them were saying stories about what they did back in 1979, how they went out kayaking. And these were just thrill-seeking, successful men. Very wealthy, 
able to go out and do things and they were talking about playing rugby and they were talking about yachting and on fishing trips and you remember that uh, marlin we caught and I thought they were going to start talking about running with the bulls in Spain at some point, you know. I mean, it was that kind of conversation, you know. And they were just, you know, suck the marrow out of life kind of guys. And you think, yeah, that's what I want to do. That's the kind of life I want to have. I want to do that kind of stuff. And I want to end up like those successful men with many stories that I can share with with my good buddies that I've known for 30 or 40 years. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But as I was listening to their conversation, I just wondered, what will those things mean in eternity if you don't know Jesus Christ? If you haven't lived your life for the King of Kings, what will all that stuff get you? That life of just seize the day, you know, carpe diem. I'm just going to seize the day. I'm going to suck the marrow out of life and just enjoy every possible thing that I can enjoy. I'm going to try every sport and I'm going to go do all that stuff. All those things are great. All those things are fun. But if you don't know Jesus Christ and you haven't yielded yourself to His Spirit and, and yielded yourself to His leading in your life, all those things will be like that rubber. Just like ashes. They'll be nothing. They will come to nothing. For eternity, they will be nothing. Eternity is an awful long time, but he says, look, the plans of the Lord, the plans of the Lord, those will stand. The counsel of the Lord, listen and receive what He says to you, because those things will last forever. And the things that you do for Him, Whatever you build on that foundation of Jesus Christ, the things that you do for Him, the good works that you do for Him, made out of gold and silver, those things will last for eternity. All of the others are wood, hay, and stubble, and they'll be burned in the fire. They won't last. And so, just wrapping up here, come and help us. Come and help us. I want you guys to be on board with that in the next two weeks. There are people down there who have said to us, come and help us. They have very clearly indicated, we want a pastor here. We need your help. There aren't a whole lot of Calvary chapels coming down to Guatemala. You know, we've, we've seen a couple down here, but you know, we're really kind of down here by ourselves. We need your help. Come and help us. We need your help. And so when that kind of door opens, what do we do? We must go through it. What is your conclusion? When you're led by the Spirit, you must obey what the Spirit is telling you to do. Isaiah 14, 24, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. God's Word. God's truth. God's leading. God's plans will last forever. And as a result, you and I need to be led by them. And as Paul did, we need to make a straight course. If that's what God wants us to do, let's do it. And he got up that next day and they headed across that waterway and they ran a straight course to that calling. I encourage you to do that in your own life. Whatever God has asked you to do, Whatever instruction He has given you in the past, it's still valid today. The gifts and callings of God are not revoked in your life. You get back on track with Him. And you keep listening and you keep waiting and you keep asking Him, Lord, yes, I want to hear from you again. And in the meantime, I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. I'm going to do the things that I know you've told me to do. And I'm going to prepare myself. And I'm going to get ready so that you can use me. And I'm going to study your word. I'm going to have that wellspring of, of things in my life from your word that I, I, can, I have a foundation on. And I can just uh, be used by you at a spur of the moment. Because, you know, just as we found last year, you never know when this thing's just going to blow up. And, and okay, it's time. The door is open. Are you ready to walk through it? Or have you been slacking? 
Have you been negligent in doing the things that he's asked you to do in the preparation time? When the door opens, are you ready to walk through it? Are you in rebellion? Do you have disobedience going on in your life so you can't walk through that door? Is your flesh in the way? Have you been walking in the flesh and when that door opens, you go, yeah, I see the door open. I know that's the Lord, but I don't want to go through there. I've got so many other things in life that are so much more fun over here that I could be doing. I'm seizing the day over here. I'm sucking the marrow out of life. It's encouragement for you today. I also just want to ask you once more, please be praying for us in the, in the next week. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your truth, Lord. And we thank you so much that you care enough for us to send your spirit. Lord, to enlighten us, to give us visions, to give us dreams that you care enough to speak to our hearts and your spirit bearing witness with our hearts that that you love us and you have a plan for our lives. That you have a, a direction that you want us to walk in. Lord, we thank you for the no's. We thank you for the weights. We thank you for the yeses, Lord. And we pray that you would just give us the courage to step through those open doors. And not just step through, Lord, but just step through with, with power and with zeal to do the work that you've called us to do. We thank you again for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.